for a policeman's knock. We've got more officers coming down that are going to conduct a thorough search of this flat because we think that Tony's been doing quite a few dwelling burglaries, so we're looking for property, we're looking for clothing to link him to those offences, OK? At the end of the day, you're bringing a lot of these problems on yourself, right? This is the second time in a week that I've been here. There's a lot of drugs getting used in this flat, but at some point something's going to have to give because you're inviting all these people around to smoke crack, all right? And then they're paying for that habit by committing crime. That's really affecting the local community. All right, mate. You're under arrest on suspicion of dwelling burglary, all right? I'll give you the circumstances in a second. I'm just going to pop these cuffs on you, OK? Um, you match the description of somebody seen on CCTV, all right? Right. Bear in mind you're under caution. Are those trainers yours? They're yours, yeah? Right, mate. There is crap pipes, burnt foil, the yeah, recent evidence of drug misuse. Yeah. Tony, you've just gone from talking to this. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. If you're going to go in an ambulance, you've got to get me downstairs anyway, Tony. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Stay with us. Stay away. 2089, priority, please. Stay away. Yeah, can you get an ambulance, please? <laughs> I know it's wrong and I know it's bad, but I do enjoy it. A lot of things need to change in the way we treat drugs in this city, in this country. I've got surgeons, I've got lawyers, I've got doctors, a huge amount of young professionals. Nick! Open your mouth! Don't smell the drugs! Spit them out! Wait, so he's breaking into your home and taking your stuff and your kids are upstairs. See how you feel. Oh, get wrecked! Stay there, don't move. I'm gonna spray you. You get so wrapped up in yourself and your addiction, sometimes you can't see the damage that you're doing to other people. I've got to change my life, otherwise I'm gonna die, you know? <laughs> Big lad, isn't he? Yeah. Do you want a hand, guys? You're right. Can you hear us? I think he's a um, class A user. Okay. Um, lots of needles in the flat that he's come from, as well as evidence of been smoking crack. If he is breathing, there is a pulse. <laughs> They're giving him something because they think that. been a frontline police officer for a very long time and it feels like a vast majority of that has all come back to one common theme and that is addiction. Reoffending rates are so high there has to be more emphasis on tackling the addiction as opposed to anything else because that is the root of it. This is me when I was a year old. So I guess as soon as I started drumming, it was just kind of an instantaneous love for it. I love everything about it. I've never taken drugs, but they control my life and everything around me. Look at some of these photos later. Yeah. My mum was a heroin addict. She's been clean for years. Every week she goes to Narcotics Anonymous meetings. That doesn't mean she's safe. She still lives on a knife edge. Look at the mess I look like. You look really yellow. You were born when I was 28 weeks pregnant and they said there had only been one person at St. Michael's who had had a baby 
when she was 24 weeks pregnant and the baby had survived. And then after that person, it was me and you, you know. More ever? Yeah. I remember when I was about, I think about 34, I'd been clean then for over three years. And my doctor, he said, if you really want to kind of experience motherhood, now it's the time because you're at the peak of your health. Your viral load is completely suppressed with these HIV drugs, you know, with the antiretrovirals. And, uh, and this is the right time for you. So you were kind of all planned from the start. I had like black eyes. I was like, I was a was. demon baby. Look at my eyes. You weren't a demon baby. <laughs> I don't, don't, don't laugh, Rita. It's not really a funny matter. You almost died and I almost died and that's how bad it got, you know? You can't imagine how serious it was, you know? You almost didn't make it, really. Oh, uh, no. You with long hair. Yeah, the, there's a picture of you and your dad. When he was still around. Oh, here it is. Oh, you found the hat? Yeah. It's going to be weird. Oh, Look. my God. My head was that small. Yes. My head was that small. <laughs> oh, my God. Isn't that freaky? Yeah, it's like a tiny. tennis ball. I you know, know it is. was. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Look at you now. <laughs> I don't know how old I was here, but I was already kind of taking heroin by then, so I must have been 18 or 19. You were taking heroin at 18? Yeah. yeah. Can't you see it in my eyes? They're just kind of dead. I'm just kind of stunned out of my head. And this is one of the few that I'm with short sleeves because until my parents found out I was on drugs, I needed to kind of, you know, hide the track marks. But here I was already taking loads of drugs with the face of just got out of bed. And my mum's all dolled up and all done up. Just been to the hairdresser, obviously, because her hair's all done up. These were the times where I was still at home. I still had lots of people around me that I'd steal from and that I'd kind of keep my drug taking going, you know, without having to do to kind of extreme and horrible things, really. And those people, because they were friends and family, they weren't really angry. They were just sad and mean because of the choices I was making and the fact that I was kind of, you know, destroying my life. At the time, it was just like I was on a mission I had to have drugs and I had to be high all the time, you know? And I had no kind of morals. I knew it was wrong, but, but that's what I had to do and that's what I did. When I moved to London, very soon I was kind of deep into trouble. I kept shoplifting, kept getting arrested, kept ending up in magistrate's courts, you know, kept getting fined. And I'd been told in no uncertain terms should I choose to keep on going down the, the same avenue that they would put me in prison. I had friends who prostituted themselves for drugs. That obviously wasn't an easy option, but it was the quickest way to get the money they needed. And there was a point that I even kind of started considering that. Up boss tonight, working till three, and um, Tina's gonna go and CCTV. Dan and Claire, you'll work together. Yep. Got everything? Right, see you down by the car. The Operation Boss is engaging with the women who are street sex working. It's reassuring the community that are affected. Uh, it's also enforcing um, against the guys that curb crawl. All the women that are street sex working in Bristol are Class A drug addicts. They will do the business and then they will straight away go and score. Um, we use the expression of clucking that, you know, that thing of like that when they're withdrawing, the symptoms that they have are just so horrific that actually they're just topping up all the time. 
They are the most vulnerable women in Bristol because they place themselves at risk of great danger every time they stand on that street corner. Okay, so she's just walking down Fishbones Road on the Oxide pavement, and uh, the man had walked off, and there is now walking back out towards her. We've got about three minutes from pick up to the sexual activity being complete, so we haven't got very long, so this is like our golden cup of Ready? minutes. Ready? Yeah. Because I suspect you have solicited a prostitute, OK? Yeah, we've got the male detained on Sandy Lane by the track. They were found in the tiniest little place. It's grim. You can't imagine having sex with someone in this location. The guy has um, decided that he wants legal advice, so he can't be interviewed in the car tonight. He's going to come back by appointment. I'm obviously worried about you because I keep seeing you out sex working. Yeah. Why, why are you out tonight? Um, basically because I've got a sort of a drug habit at the moment. What drugs are you using? Uh, crack and heroin. How long have you been using drugs for? Um, about eight years on and off. Do you, you get the same buzz as you got no, the first time? No, you never will. That's what you're always trying to chase continuously. And what's it like withdrawing from drugs? It's unbearable. Uh, hallucinations, agitation. It's like the flu, but a thousand times worse. Do you feel yeah. like you're living at the moment? My life is on hold at the moment. Up until like two years ago, I spent every Christmas with my family, but two years ago, it was the first Christmas I literally spent on my own, didn't have no one, and that's all down to drugs. Do you know what I mean? And before I know it, another 10 years is going to go by. And Well, all I hope is that in a year's time or whatever, you know, like, you and I don't see each other, or when we see each other, we'll be able to have, you know, a conversation around you and it'll be, you know, totally different, won't yeah, it? Yeah, I hope so, definitely. Would you, uh, lovely people, like a coffee at McDonald's? I'll shout your coffee. Yeah, it's very kind. I can't actually do anything without taking drugs. I find it very hard to have the motivation or energy to have a shower, to straighten my hair, do my washing up, do anything without having a hit first. I can't do anything. This is crack. Before I get my money, I can't wait, I'm so excited, I can't wait for a smoke, and the actual thought of doing it is actually better than when I do it, because when I do it, it's not what I, what, what I expect it to be. I was 13 when I started smoking crack. 14, 15 when I started doing heroin. I used to always run away from the children's home because I wanted to go back to my mum. And I'd run away and I asked someone for a cigarette and she gave it to me and asked what I was doing walking through the park late at night. And me being naive and stupid told her that I'd run away, blah, blah, blah. And she said I could stay with her. So I did, I went, and she had children, so. I thought she'd be all right with the woman. 
but they always say, watch, be careful of the bad men, the bad man. There's lots of bad women out there. They don't tell you that. And then she had me smoking crack and then sleeping with a drug dealer after. So that was how I started and then I never stopped. I don't feel much hatred towards her. I feel more hatred towards myself for being so naive and fucking stupid. But I also have to keep telling myself I was only a youngster. I'm finished now, just about. <laughs> Everyone tells me that I need to get myself some willpower. Just be strong, get yourself some willpower. Stop, just stop, just don't do it. If it was that fucking easy, I'd give my right or left arm to have this obsession taken away from me. It's ruined my life. I have no life, but... Sometimes I feel like I'm doing it even against my will, because I don't want to do it. I hate sometimes the way it leaves me feeling, but I'm still doing it. I don't know why. Clean up after myself. And not leave anything. So that I was even there. People kind of call it rock bottom. In your lifetime, I think you have various ones, but sometimes you can't see it, and sometimes you can't grab that opportunity to change your life and go the right way, you know? I remember this. Oh, wait, I do. Where am I? Is that me? That's you. Yeah, that's you. <laughs> I, remember, I remember having this. Yeah. Why did I put green on my face? Going through detox and rehab over and over again, it's <laughs> like really hard. Literally. But I really admire my mum for doing it. It's really that. kind of inspiring. These photos are of me when I moved to London, mm. where I did a lot of my using. Who's that? Is that you? That's me. This was me and a couple of Portuguese mates strolling a joint, I think. It's another friend of mine who died of AIDS many, many years ago. She had this baby over here. Is and that... he's dead as well. He's the husband. They were both HIV positive as well. Mm. They both died with AIDS at some point, her and him. Mm. He also ended up catching HIV and dying from AIDS at some point. If I think just about kind of partners and boyfriends that died from, you know, active addiction as a result of, you know, all the drugs they took, there was one, two, three, four. There was eight that I can count. I'm one of the few kind of not just survived it, but, but stopped taking drugs. There's not really that many people from my adolescence and kind of early adulthood that have survived it. The turning point was when I developed a type of pneumonia and I got really ill, so ill that uh, if I don't change my life, I'm gonna die kind of thing. If I don't stop taking drugs, I'm gonna die. <laughs> Residential treatment is probably the best place, really, for you to be successful. There's lots of practical care that they provide that make you feel like this is the most comfortable and cozy way in which I could detox, yeah. which really helps. Can I manage those? Can I give you a hand? I'll be OK, thanks. Nice to see you. Yeah, thank you. And you? I've been reducing my methadone and I've okay, sort of come to detox off mm, it. Mm. And unfortunately, another little mild heroin detox, uh, he uh, alcohol detox, and I was sure. using a bit of heroin the week yeah. before I came in yeah. and, and some crack. I've hit a few rock bottoms. I've lost 
six friends in the last four years. Mm, I'm really sorry to hear that. You know, for years I, I could use and drink and people wouldn't notice. Okay, yeah. It was getting to the point where it was very obvious okay. something yeah. was wrong. Sure. And, and um, I could just see it ending in death or jail. Yeah. And, and also, I feel I've got a lot to offer, there's stuff I want to do, I want to live mm. life, you know, sure. I want to see things, yeah. experience things. Yeah. And weirdly, for the first time in my life, like, I started thinking that perhaps I'd like children. Okay, yeah, yeah. A few yeah, of my so. cousins have recently had kids, mm. and they're amazing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I started using heroin when I was about 21. It was, I didn't get fully addicted until I was about 23, so it's about 12 years. The main reason I was taking it is to cover up huge amounts of trauma. Um, being abused as a teenager, my parents splitting up, my, my relationship with my dad falling apart, um, being in a house fire. As I was stood there in the street, watching my whole life burn down, a heroin dealer passed me and offered me some heroin. And that was a better solution than killing myself. Um, it took all my pain away. Heroin saved my life. And some people might not be able to understand that, but that was the reality. You get so wrapped up in yourself and your addiction, sometimes you can't see the damage that you're doing to other people. But I started to realise how much I'm hurting my family, how much, you know, I'm hurting my mum. I, I got to a place of hopelessness, I tried to kill myself uh, through overdosing. I've ended up injecting in my groin, I've had a needle snap off in my groin. If I don't stop, like, I'm going to lose my family, I could lose my limbs and ultimately I could die. It must be a constant battle to be able to resist that temptation. And I think for those of us that haven't had that, we really don't know what that must feel like. I think those people deserve all of our support, whichever way or form we, we administer that. For me, it might be arresting somebody. Ben. But maybe that's the start of the next two years of their recovery, or hopefully... <laughs> There you go. See, as soon as he comes in, he's, he's, he's sort of bending over. At no point does he look at the camera or do you get a clear shot of his face. So, on that basis, he's going to get bail. Yeah, you can't 100% ID him because you haven't got his face, have you? No. So now is the difficult bit because I've got to go and tell the victim There we go then, 8.29, all right? See you later on, my babs, all right? First of all, we thought we just misplaced a few things. It went until I got a phone call from my wife saying that her bag's missing, her cards are all gone, the laptop was missing, gold earrings was missing, the baby's change bag was missing. Can't stand him, honestly can't stand him. Wait till he's breaking into your home and taking your stuff when your kids are upstairs. See how you feel. Do you know what I mean? I get it, as a police officer, I understand that we need such a high level of proof, but as the victim, quite rightly, he's not gonna be able to understand. We get people in here who are obviously on drugs. They're not breaking into our ice. They're not breaking into the shop. They're not breaking into the cars. Do you see what I mean? There's just zero excuse for that. None whatsoever. I'm not your favorite officer, no. am I? So, it was, it was hard yesterday because all we've got is a guy in a crack house yeah. with clothing around the place that we can link to the CCTV shot. So this is the items of clothing that we've got. I think we've got the trainers, yeah. the jeans, perfect, and we've definitely got that high-vis jacket, the sleeveless high-vis jacket. So, but we haven't got any face shots. It's frustrating for you because someone's burgled your house and the yeah. kids are upstairs. I know, I get it. I can't, I'm not allowed to know where he lives, I'm not allowed to know what he does, where he goes, but he knows everything about me. Yeah. He knows what I look like, he knows what my kids look like, he knows what my missus looks like. My laptop had pictures of my kids on as well. 
He knows all of that, but I'm not allowed to know nothing. And this is where it feels like victims get left out the loop and the attention's on yeah, the, the, right, the rights are all on the person. Yeah, yeah I know. It's yeah. Like, I know. I, yeah. I completely understand. All I say though, is I know you're passionate about it and you and you want someone, I want someone as well. Yeah. And we will, I'm, I'm confident we'll get there, yeah. just leave it to us yeah. and we'll do our thing. Yeah, I know. Obviously, if anything does happen to him now, I'm the first person they're going to knock on the door for, aren't I? Yeah. Yeah, I know that. That's that. I know right. you're frustrated. But yeah, it's mate. It's annoying. All right, cheers, Andre. Thanks, cheers, mate. Cheers. Why would you let him out? Just want a whole world of pain to come then, don't you, really? Yeah, of course you do, do you yeah. Know what I mean? It's Andy, really. They didn't put him in prison and cut her hands off. They didn't care who's upstairs. That's it, they're coming to, they didn't care. And what I say is, if, he wants, if he's got that much of an addiction that he's got to keep doing it, what's going to stop him hurting someone? And anyone who knows me, you can ask him. I, I'm, nice, I'm a nice chap. But someone who does that, I wouldn't throw a bucket of water on if they're on fire. I need some water. <coughs> What's this cough like? Oh, God. I'm not a young carer or anything, but I think I kind of have the mentality of one. If there was one thing I could do for my mum, I would make all her illnesses go away. She's gotten rid of one really big illness already, which is hep C. Uh, but she's still got HIV and loads of other medical problems that really kind of <coughs> set her back. <coughs> oh, that does not seem like the front of all you. I don't know You're popping my do. shoulder rather than my back. That help? <coughs> it's just not nice to see your mum that way because she's ill all the time. <coughs> You've been coughing loads today and, like, we just cough. And I feel like a 90 or under the old woman when that happens. It's just horrible. It's what just... you should do is for one time when you get it really bad and just relax, like literally don't do anything, just look after yourself, like eat food, literally don't do anything and then I bet you'll get better really quickly. Yeah. Love you too. Okay, bye. It'll be good. Yeah. Bye. Bye. <coughs> to me, HIV was just a disease that my mum had. I could have got it from my mum giving birth to me, but they had all these measures to stop that from happening. But it's like a disease that's seen as very kind of hush-hush, don't talk about it, it's a bad thing to have. And um, you don't kind of realise that when you're a kid because you've grown up with this mum who's open like to talking about it, she talks about it with her friends, her friends are fine with it, so you just have this kind of accepting bubble that you live in. And that's why he hangs around, isn't it? To my friends, drugs are just things that are recreational and you take them for fun and they're not really anything serious. But with me, because of my parents, it's something entirely different. It's just hard to understand why anyone would go near them in the first place. To get rid of the opiates from my system, I'm here for two weeks doing a detox with as much medical and psychological support as possible. How are you? Yeah, just bearing up. <laughs> I've been really shaking, sweating a lot. If you could just relax that arm for me, that'd be great. Are you normally anxious, or is this anxiety um, to do with withdrawing? Some of the anxiety is definitely to do with withdrawing. OK, cos we've got some um, anti-anxiety um, medication. Coming into a detox unit, it's, it's about <laughs> ten times easier than a cold turkey. Before, I just thought it was, you know, like a physical thing. 
but the fact of the matter is it's you know it's far deeper than that it's it's physical mental emotional and a spiritual thing any drug cravings um i'm not really craving drugs just that thought that oh you might get away with using it keeps popping into my head i've actually got clean four times before but I've relapsed every time because I've never really looked at myself, my pain, my traumas, my character defects. My dad died when I was 11 because of addiction. We both went to Gloucester Cathedral when I was younger and I had a really nice memory from that. I think I've still kind of got a very fluffy view of him because I am aware that, you know, he made really bad choices and definitely wasn't the perfect dad. And I love focusing on the good memories and the good things he did and I think overall they outweigh the bad things. So this is where you sat with him. We were standing over there and he was looking up at that window and then I saw him crying and I asked him why and he said it because it was so beautiful. Oh. And I didn't really get it then. Yeah. I just thought, I well, guess because... he likes it because he worked it. Yeah. But now I kind of do. It was just really sad. So sad that he's not around anymore. So sad that he, you know, can't do the things he loved anymore. So sad that he chose to go down a road that just kind of had him dead when he was 50. I'm going to be 50 this year, you know? And just kind of thinking, actually, with the life I'm leading and, and, and you know, in my house and stuff, it looks like I actually have some prospects of kind of being around for a while, you know? Seeing you grow up, growing older, maybe having children, you know, and all that kind of stuff, you know. Like, I remember a couple of months before he died, I wrote him that letter saying that if I didn't see him, it would give him, like, a push to, like, get better. And I kind of... I wanted him to, like... I thought it was he was close to getting better. Wow. The thing is, he probably, you know, he didn't want it bad enough, did he? Because otherwise he would have. He would have got better, Rita. But he just kind of decided it wasn't worth it, which is just so, so sad, because he was such a special person, wasn't he? and could have done so much more with his life if he had stuck around and kind of made the right choices, really. Even when he was in hospital, even then, I had this kind of vision of the future where, like, I'd help him get better and he wouldn't, like, ever go near the stuff again. And then it would be like he would be, like, the dad I always wanted him to be. Well, I suppose mm. that's the thing about addiction being more powerful than anything, isn't it? and especially being more powerful than whatever love you have for your, you know, for your family, you know. In this case, for him, it was his love for you, isn't it? My biggest fear is ultimately ending up like my dad. Just because you leave so many people behind with so many questions that, you know, you can't answer and you can't help them. One, two, five's unique to Bristol. 
It's a charity that's successful in getting women out of the vicious cycle of drug use and sex work. It's just an amazingly safe feeling place. Only women are allowed in. Karen's been a drug user for many years, lots of childhood problems, lots of abuse problems. After 20 years of heavy drug use, about five years ago she was noticed to have deteriorating renal function, um, diagnosed as chronic renal failure, which we've been monitoring over the last, I'd say, yeah, three to four years, slowly deteriorating. She definitely will die if she doesn't start dialysis this year. And when I went with her to see the renal consultant, she asked him how she would die if she chose not to start. And yeah, dying from renal failure isn't a bad death. You just kind of, toxins build up and you gradually become sleepier and it's not a painful death. It, could be quite an attractive way to die if you're a drug user. So it's a real dif difficult decision for her. But yeah, my pain's pretty well managed at the moment. OK. And is there a problem with getting the patches changed every 72 hours, as opposed to having one that you change Sometimes weekly? Sometimes I put them on a day early. The pain's really bad. I've put it on a day early to try and avoid me using it. It's what I've been doing to avoid me using it. I don't know if that's... And you're not using? And I'm not using, no. And you said it's been six days? It's been six days. It's Seven fantastic. days tomorrow, yeah. And that's really good, Karen. It's really, really good. You, you, you've not been used... I mean, just think how bad it was. And you're at the hostel and you're just feeling safer there. Yeah, and I'm doing more things around the hostel, cooking and getting involved with other stuff going in the hostel. OK. I'm going to do dialysis now. You're... I'm going to do it. You are. How am I going to tell my brother and sister that I'm not going to do it, that I'm just going to kill myself? I've got two nephews. How am I going to tell them that I'm just going to kill myself? I don't even know where to begin that conversation with them. So, um, I'm not going to. <laughs> I'm going to do dialysis, so... So, yeah. Oh, that's brilliant, love. I'm really, really pleased that okay. you feel like that. <laughs> <laughs> So welcome everyone. So today is your first community meeting. So what we do is we go around, introduce ourselves, say a little bit how we're feeling, and then afterwards we'll just discuss if there's any community issues. Is there anybody that would like to start? Anybody? I suppose I'd better start, as I've been here the longest. I'm Tom, um, I've been here a week. Um, it's going surprisingly well. Um, physically, it's the easiest detox I've ever done. I'm starting to get my emotions back for the first time in ages, that's a bit weird. I woke up this morning and just started crying for no reason, didn't know why, just burst into tears. Hadn't cried for God knows how long. Well, since I was last here, <laughs> probably. <laughs> the anger, the sadness, the, the remorse, guilt, all of those experiences come rushing back. The one thing that has emerged over this week is I've never, ever managed to get over my parents splitting up and like my dad leaving, the way that it happened and the deterioration of our relationship. But now I'm at a point where in my, in my mind I've forgiven him like, um, and yeah, I just, you know, I want my dad back, you know. I want to live a normal, happy life. I want to be a son to my mum. I want to be, you know, there for my brother. My young brother Nathan is coming and this will be the first visit from him whilst I've been here. I'm feeling nervous, I'm like really nervous, but it's going to be really good to see him, which will be quite emotional, and hopefully he'll be really pleased with uh, you know, my progress. I'll leave you to it, guys. Okay. Hello. <laughs> How are you feeling, bro? Yeah. Well, huh? You look good. Thank you. Of everything, and I feel better. I guess I just I did a lot more work on the build up to this. Yeah. Like, I, wasn't, I wasn't using anywhere near as much, yeah, yeah. and like, I just did it properly, really. When do you leave? Monday. Okay. Right. How are you feeling? Um, uh, nervous, excited, 
happy, worried. Yeah. You name it. <laughs> it's going to be great. Yeah. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah. I kept it secret for him for quite a long time because he's 10 years younger than me. I wanted to protect him from it. And um, I guess because our dad wasn't about, he looked up to me as a, a role model. So um, and I feel like I've really let him down because of that. But yeah, hopefully I'll be able to, you know, have a strong recovery and make, find ways to make things up to him. Right, nice one, mate. Take care. We're having healthy option food tonight. Which, which just kind of means meat, maybe some halloumi, some salad, if some got, sort, yeah. in a pitta. Yeah, but if you've bread. got a bit of coriander in there and a bit of hummus, yeah. it's technically like it's healthy. Right, we've got information that's come in. Tony, the burglar, is somewhere around those flats. He's been seen in the area. And the good news is, he slipped up. His face is now on CCTV using stolen credit cards after the burglary. This time, he's not going to get bail. Right, here we are. So I'm reckoning we'll just sit tight for a bit. If they've already gone back out, and then they come across this way, the first time they're gonna see us is when they're pretty much head on and we'll make a positive ID. Yeah. And then we'll literally just go out and grab them. If he gets arrested tonight, then we stop people's houses getting broken into for the next few nights, because... He's just on a spree, isn't he? He is, a mad one. He must be desperate if he's breaking into people's houses when they're asleep upstairs. Yeah. Not just morally, but because of the risks to them as well, the homeowner coming downstairs and smashing the face in. Yeah. I'm gonna have a wreck inside. Yeah. Go and have a look at some of the doors, see if any of them look shit. Yeah, right, be safe. In a bit. That's our man, get ready. Right, I'm gonna spray you. So let's have a go. Okay. I'm just gonna spray you. Because one of us is gonna get run over in a minute. Right. Right. I just need to get your search for you there, right? You're under arrest by me. That's the one. The burglar at Freem Terrace. You're linked to that offence by CCTV. Bring him up. I haven't searched him yet. It does really feel like at times that there's no end in sight. It feels like the handcuffs that you're putting on that individual today, you're going to be here next week, next month, next year, doing exactly the same again. People are allowed to go through this revolving door of the criminal justice system year after year, decade after decade, but will go back to the addiction. What would you put your um, lack of memory down to? Drugs. What drugs are we talking about? Heroin and crack. Heroin and crack. And how often do you use heroin? Every day. How often do you use crack? Every day. How much heroin do you use a day? As much as I can get my hands on. Do you want to talk to me at all about your current lifestyle? I've been on drugs all my life. 
No. I come to Bristol. Yeah, I come up here for a new start. Yeah. And it's been going well, and then I sort of split up with my girlfriend about two years ago. Two years ago? Oh, no, not even. About a year ago. Okay. Yeah, about a year ago, and just got slowly back involved in drugs. So you spiraled drug in, back into drug use about a year ago, did you? Yeah. I think we'll get back out of it. Okay. From a government level, there has to be more emphasis on tackling the addiction. I think that if we were to do that, then we would have less people committing acquisitive crime. appreciate how precious and how sometimes short life can be. So I try to live in the moment and as fullest as I can. But I still have an illness that limits my quality of life because of the drugs. A third of the time I'm unable to look after myself, you know. PEEP stands for personal independence payment and it's basically the financial help to allow me to live independently. Like the days that I can't look after myself or look after my daughter or look after the dog, then I've got some kind of funds to get in a taxi and still kind of, you know, go to my hospital appointment. I've just had my PEEP entitlement denied. And I disagree with that decision. And now the next step is to go through the appeal process. Okay, so we've basically done your PIP application. You've been to the medical, and this is their decision, which was to award zero points for every area. I feel like she didn't hear me. Mm -hmm. I feel like she didn't hear me. I felt like she didn't really had great understanding, you know, of my medical condition. She didn't seem to understand what was the effects of living with HIV and what was the side effects from being on long-term medication. I mean, really, it's the complex medical history and the long-term effects of having Lived yeah, with HIV yeah, for 25 yeah, years, yeah, Hep C yeah, for yeah. however long. Well, Hep C since I was 18, really. I got rid of it two years ago, but... But ultimately, I would be expecting mm. it to go to tribunal. Mm, mm. Um, and I think that is the, the best place, given mm. such a poor outcome at this <laughs> level, for them to really hear your case. Even in those areas that I think you know, I've got no difficulties whatsoever. At times I do, mm -hmm. you know? It's mm -hmm. just like, I don't want to acknowledge it, because if I acknowledge it, I feel like I've lost, you know? I've lost this kind of life that I've been trying to build for myself and try to be as independent as I can be. Mm -hmm. It's had such a impact in my kind of well-being that mm -hmm. I just kind of want it over and done with. Mm -hmm. After a two-week detox, yeah, it feels good. I can feel. <laughs> it's strange, but it's nice. At first, I was so sort of attached to my um, old lifestyle that I was finding it hard to let go. But then, like, as I went through the detox and I started to get my clarity back and um, a clear mind. I realised that it was um, much better just to go straight to rehab. It's much safer, it's easier, and um, it's the wise thing to do. In my mind, it is going to work out for me. However, if it doesn't work, then it's a case of just regrouping, picking up the pieces and trying again. And anybody who works in this area will, will tell you that most addicts take five or six attempts before they actually stay clean for the rest of their lives. 
but I'm on attempt five now, so <laughs> hopefully it should work out okay. If I'm honest, I'm afraid. I feel very vulnerable admitting that, but that's the truth. People's addiction will peak in trough. So I see somebody and the first thing they want to tell me is, just to let you know, I've been clean for two years. And that is a real big milestone and a big achievement. And then I just see people that seem to use drugs until the end. I've been looking at his previous. He's not your usual yeah. criminal. He's, that's he's a, a career criminal. He's got 48 pages on PNC of burglary, assault and theft. That, that is a pretty impressive resume. Yeah. His first ever offence, pleaded guilty to a burglary in 1988. I was at nursery school then. He's probably one of those people, you know, they first tried a bit of heroin when they're, like, in their early teens. Yeah, yeah. And then that's it. Game over, then. Boom. Hello, Tony. I've got some charges to read out. Six charges, Tony, for Dwayne Burglary. Between the 5th of the 10th, 2016, on the 6th of the 10th, 2016, have entered as a trespasser or a dwelling. Stole therein a handbag, Samsung tablet, and cash to a value of the Hello, you all right? I'm Yeah, do you want to come out? I basically gave a cock and bull story as to why he was in possession of stolen cards. If he has a trial over it and it goes the wrong way for him, he's looking at a really substantial sentence. What, five, six, seven, eight? They got offered a bucket of money. Yeah. Then think of all the times that he's been offered help with his drug habit and something's not quite clicking, is it? So the but only way he, to he stop him... He doesn't want help, does he? Wow. Obviously not. He's happy doing what he does. But, I mean, you only let him out a couple of days after he'd done it again, so you might as well bang him up, throw away the key. He's no good to society, is he? What, what good is he to us? Yeah. It's true, though, isn't it? He's just I don't, gonna know, might, I don't think you get. You might try drugs and then you get into it and you commit crime, but then you think maybe you should come out the other end, especially at that age after you've been doing it so long. But that's not the case with this one. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Chris. All, All right. right. Nice to speak to you. Anyway. Yeah. All right, right Andre. You Cheers, take care. Mate. Bye. Cheers, mate. For me, the Kung Fu has been like, a really important part of my recovery. It's worth getting out and meeting some new people and exercise is just massively beneficial. It's like a natural high. I decided that maybe staying in Bristol wasn't the best option. So I ended up coming to rehab in Cornwall and um, it's one of the best decisions I ever made. As a recovering addict, I guess like my area of Expertise is addiction. <laughs> it would be great to like give something back, maybe mentoring some people, help other fellow addicts who are still struggling. It would almost help give me some sort of meaning to all the chaos that I've been through. So it's not just all negative, some positive has come from it. Stop taking drugs is just the beginning, really, and I think very few people realise that. Hey, Blake, that's gross. <laughs> oh, Blake, you're gonna stink. Look at that. It's really hard to get Blake. out of the place that you're in, and it takes years and years. It could take decades. It could take the rest of your life, really. Even after all the meetings and like treatment and rehab and everything and having like a family, even after all that, I know that there's still going to be temptations for my mum. I'm aware that it's kind of really easy for my mum to go back to square one and I'm very proud of her that she hasn't yet and I believe that she won't ever go there again. It's going to be almost two months since I had my 50th birthday. 
can't quite believe that, you know, I've made it here, really. And I thought I'd never live to see her too. And now here I am, definitely feeling better than ever before, you know. Do I have to look at you? You have to look at the lens. The lens. Rita's is 15 now, which means I've got to be around at least for another 20 years. Because it would be really cool to kind of be a grandma, you know. <laughs> happy? Yeah, happy. Being an addict can happen to anyone. There are people who've had it way worse than my mum and my dad. But no matter how kind of low you get, there's always like a exit button. Every single person on this planet, and that includes people like the Dalai Lama, okay, are fallible human beings. We make bad choices at times. It makes us human. I was massively inspired by um, psychotherapists and rehab. 